Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Urban Wine Club webinar series. And in this segment, we are happy and excited to have the Forte Cano Rum Cocktail Webinar. And with us, we have our special guest, Kayla Quigley, who is the brand ambassador of Florida Cano based out of Massachusetts. So let's jump into the segment. Uh, in, you know, in, in uh, uh, spending time with us, because I'm sure you're, you know, you've got a lot going on and being the brand ambassador for such a reputable um, company and family, um, you know, it's an honor to have you here with us. And, you know, it's also exciting to know that rum, because I've been sipping rum for a while and um, it's been so overlooked by not just, you know, the, the industry, but even my, my close friends and family who, you know, who consider themselves, you know, drinkers and they, they mentioned they're, they're big scotch drinkers and they're big tequila drinkers and they spend a ton of money on some of these products. But then it only, it, it, it really boggles okay. my mind that they've never really dipped into, into rum, but I've had some, I've done some experiments where I've just poured out rum uh, for some of my, my friends and so forth without letting them know what it was and had no idea sure. that it was rum. <laughs> like this can't be rum. But, uh, and having said that, I'd like for you to kind of go into the fact of, you know, what rum really is and what makes rum um, and what are the processes that go uh, behind the scenes of making rum? Sure. Yeah. And I, I think you, you've touched on a lot of subjects, right? Like that the perception, I think the overarching theme in, in what you just said is ultimately that the perception of rum is not necessarily what rum translates to in market, right? And in bottle and in liquid form. So, you know, if anything, I hope that today's conversation kind of changes that perspective for people to think that, you know, ultimately rum doesn't have to be that sugary cocktail spirit that you have on the beach or on a cruise or, right. you know, some, somewhere out there that's like cheap, inexpensive, and can't be enjoyed neat or on the rocks as you're enjoying yours on the rocks right mm -hmm. now. And I'm enjoying mm -hmm. mine neat. So cheers, <laughs> cheers friend. Um, you know, I mean, so um, all from a, a cultural uh, sort of this cultural moment that we're in right now is certainly on the rise, which for a brand like Florida Cana, for a rum lover such as myself, is really important because for for people to recognize that rum can be different from yep. brand to brand, from region to region, from aging processes to the way that it's just produced in general, right? Once you start to really get into that nitty gritty, it's a different spirit altogether, right? Like it, it, it really has a lot of nuance. Um, so in our conversation today, I do want to just kind of preface it with, we are talking about rum as an overarching category. There are many rum brands out there that do things very differently or exactly the same as what I will describe in just a moment. Uh, so please don't get, get too upset if I don't discuss the exact process uh, That's okay. of, of some of your an, favorite an rum over, brands an, out there. An overview would be fine. Sure. So uh, rum, when it starts, uh, its base is sugar cane, uh, which looks very much like bamboo. It is a tall stalk. Um, it, it grows in incredibly hot climates. So you can find it in Florida and pretty much south, um, you know, pretty much south, southern U.S. and then Central and Southern America and, of course, the Caribbean. I think a lot of our understanding of rum typically comes from the Caribbean, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, sure. But rum can be made anywhere in the world if people have access to sugarcane or its byproducts. So the definition that, like the working definition of rum is essentially a sugarcane distillate that is then fermented and distilled to produce a cane spirit, right? So it's very straightforward. When you, the process of how rum is made is also pretty straightforward. So you have your raw material, right? You have your organic material, which will you know, sugar cane is, is what we're going to call that. So you have sugar cane, you cut down sugar cane. And what happens when you cut it is that the inside looks very much like bamboo uh, okay. and you press it and sugar comes out. Liquid sugar comes out of it. When you press that, it's very sweet. It's just rich with sugar because it literally is sugar. <laughs> right. So from there, you press out that liquid and you can either make rum right from that liquid Oh, wow. Or you can go into a fermenting process or excuse me, a uh, refinement process when you're making rum. So that first stage of rum where you just press the liquid out and then you go into fermentation. Now, the two things that happen in fermentation that are important are that alcohols are converted or sugar is converted into alcohol, excuse yep. me, 
and that gas is created co2 what we drink in our soda you know beer what have you sure. and we'll come back to that about florida caña later on so those two those are the byproducts of fermentation in some particular rums they ferment that juice that comes right off of the cane and then from there they go into distillation now it's super simple what happens with distillation right people make it very complicated and there's many ways to distill but the simplest way to understand it is you take almost a beer where you have raw material, yeast, water, that ferments, creates an alcohol. You boil that, it turns into vapor, you eliminate the water, and from there you collect the alcohol. That's essentially what distillation is doing. Now when you do it many times, you get what we call a pure alcohol, right? You right. want, that's why other companies boast like, we're 20 times distilled, right? <laughs> you hear that a lot in, in some so companies. Does, does, does that necessarily mean, uh, Kayla, the more it's distilled, the better it is? Or is that just preference? No, not necessarily. Because, okay. right, for, so for us, which we'll talk about the process of Flor de Caña later, but Flor de Caña is distilled only five times. Because okay. when you distill, what you still want is to have some of those, what we call the chemical compounds that you want are called esters, right? They're the the fragrance, they're the flavor. You still want those compounds to be a part of what your final product is. Gotcha. So if you over distill, what you end up with is neutral spirit. You end up with something that tastes Flavorless. and smells like nothing other than alcohol, right? Or, and so or hand from the, exactly, or <laughs> hand sanitizer, right? How how topical? Like, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, and so from there, you lose a little bit about it. And that's the art of distillation. That's the art of fermentation. And every brand is going to do that a little bit differently. Right. So from there, you've just created from that juice coming right off of the cane. What you've created is a French style of rum called rum agricole. And it is very unique to uh, an island in the Caribbean called Martinique. There are very few producers that, you know, actually produce this style of rum it's very herbal it's very grassy it's very bright and it's absolutely delicious but it's a little funky okay. um so not necessarily what you would commonly have in your rum and coke right then from there right so let's move on to a different style of rum the next style of rum and the most common style of rum is going to be from molasses as its raw material so when you press out sugar cane right come back to the process of the sugar cane itself when you press that what ends up happening is the liquid comes out and then you basically spin that in a giant centrifuge. You spin that liquid and you create sugar crystals. Those sugar crystals are taken to whatever sugar refinery you have and then refined and shipped to you to put into your coffee, to put into your simple syrup, to put into whatever it is that you use granulated sugar for essentially, mm -hmm. right? The byproduct, the waste of that particular process is molasses which has a very rich history here in Boston, right? Oh, and in the Northeast does. in general. And so that byproduct is like liquid gooey gold for rum. Wow. <laughs> like, wow. what you have, so that is what the majority of rums are made from is that molasses base. So what ends up happening is you take that molasses base, that, that you know, really sticky mess and you add water and you add yeast and the same fermentation process happens as we were talking about before. So you have the yeast eats up those sugars, converts that into alcohol, and then converts that into CO2. So you start to see that bubbling on the top of your fermentation tank. If you've ever been to a brewery, you would see this as well. It's the same process. Okay. And then from there, we distill, right? It's the same exact process. Same thing happens. So from there, what happens after distillation? What What's the next step? A lot of companies, a lot of brands, and a lot of rums out there will change aging, okay? So what happens when you age a product? Only two things should happen when you age a product. It should soften the taste because you're typically using wood, right? You have to use some sort of wood to age any spirit. You're getting color from the barrel because that wood tannin is imparting the color to Sure. what's coming off of the still something and then just for for all of us to note anything that you distill i don't care if it's a pisco to a whiskey to a vodka to a rum anywhere if you're distilling something it comes clear, clear when it's right? distilled yeah. it's clear 
So a lot of people think like, oh, it's a whiskey. It must come off the still with this color, right? And by off the still, I mean, when it's done distilling and you have whiskey at the end product, it is clear. Everything is clear. The same thing happens for tequila. The same thing happens for rum. Doesn't matter which category. Everything is clear after it's distilled. So when you see a product out there, you any color is because of a couple of things. You want it to be from the barrel, naturally aged, because from there the color is coming from the actual barrel itself imparting that oak or cherry wood or whatever it is, whatever right. barrel type you're using, right? And then from there, that's it. That should be the only color. <laughs> if you have anything else that's coming in, it's caramel coloring, which there's a lot of laws about, you know, how much is allowed in different countries and whatnot, and what you're allowed to put on labels or, you know, includes coloring sure. and all of that. Uh, and then that's it. That's really the only it's way that you get color in a bottle. Um, so, you know, rum is very simple. It's just like other spirits in that sense where the raw material is sugar cane. What happens from that point of cutting down that sugar cane can vary. What happens in fermentation is pretty straightforward. It really has to do with your raw material. How long you ferment something will indicate how dry it's going to be because think about it, that yeast is eating the sugars. Right. So you're not gonna have a very product, right? And then from there, how many times you distill will indicate how quote unquote pure the liquid is, which really is up to the brand and what the ultimate goal is of the brand. So the takeaway here, Kayla, is basically that at the end of the day, rum is based off of sugar cane. Correct. Sugar cane. So that's basically the base of the spirit. Yep. And, and it that's typically exactly comes it. clear, right? Okay, great. Exactly. Um, and I do want to say, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, I want to say also, right? So when people think that rum comes from sugar, that's incorrect in a sense, right? It doesn't come from sugar in the way that it's from your table sugar that you put in your coffee. Right. It comes from sugar and not like simple syrup as you would put into a cocktail. It comes from sugar cane. It's no more, it's no different than whiskey in the sense that whiskey isn't made from corn syrup. Does that make sense? Cor yeah, yes, for, definitely, Excellent. yes. Perfect. So now let's move on to, to, the, uh, to the more fascinating uh, part of this segment is, uh, so you represent, in my opinion, one of the best producers of rum in the world, you know? Thank you. Uh, Florida Kanya. Can you talk to us a little bit about Florida Kanya, its history, and what our audience should know about Florida Kanya? Absolutely. It is a, it's a long-winded history that I will give you the very abridged version of for today's sure. purposes. Uh, so Florida Kanya gets its start in 1890. So we are 130 years old this year. Uh, so quite quite the longevity with the brand and with the company. Happy birthday. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> you know, we are, we're 130 years old. Our founder came from Genoa, Italy to Nicaragua, which is where we still produce our rum. Uh, Nicaragua is in Central America for us that need a map in front of us. Um, and he moved there with zero intention of making rum. Uh, in fact, when he moved there, the, the gold rush had kind of petered out, but was still something that was pretty active for people getting from east to west in the U.S. Yep. And the Panama Canal was still underway in construction. So there was a very popular route that was through Nicaragua. So what would happen is that people would come from, you know, through New Orleans, get yep. on a, a boat, come through Nicaragua, all the way through the river, the lake, and then back out to the river to the Pacific. And so... This route became incredibly popular for a lot of people to get from east to west. The, there are many factors for why that route then became a little bit less popular, uh, primarily the Panama Canal. Uh, and so what ended up happening is that we, sorry for my dog, I apologize. Uh, so, <laughs> so what ended up happening is he said, all right, what the heck am I gonna do? I've made a decent amount of money. What am I gonna do? What's my next venture? And so he took up route in Nicaragua and purchased a sugar mill. And so, as I said, rum stems from sugar cane, right? So right. every year to celebrate the harvest, what they would do is they would take that tiny bit of molasses and they would distill it. And that was sort of the celebratory action that was happening. And as we know with wine, with a, any spirit really, what ends up happening is something small gains sort of regional acclaim and then national acclaim and then global acclaim, right? Like that's sort of the goal. And so what ended up happening is that this spirit, they were like, 
holy crap, this is pretty good stuff. <laughs> and people around were like, we're looking forward to this happening. And we ended up, I mean, you flash forward 130 years. Florida Caña is now still operating as a sugar mill. We have a sister yeah. company. Uh, so we still make our own sugar uh, and our own molasses. We are single estate. Uh, and for, for those that don't know, single estate is simply that we control everything from field to bottle. So we have 37,000 acres, give or take, of sugar cane that we harvest ourselves and we deal sure. with our sugar mill. We take that molasses and that's what we distill for Florida Caña. So we Kaylin, are in 70 you, uh, plus countries. No, please. So basically, would that be the equivalent for those of us that are wine lovers? Uh, sure. When you see on the labels, estate grown. So basically, wine, wine producers uh, who sure. basically also farm and grow their own grapes, produce their own wine. Would that be the equivalent? Exactly. Okay. That's the exact same. Yes. Uh, so being single estate, estate grown, you can think about it in the same sense as viniculture in that idea where instead of grapes, it's sugar cane. Um, okay, and good. so because we have every aspect of it, again, we started as a sugar mill. So we have this ability to then harvest, produce refined sugar, take that byproduct, and then produce rum at a global scale. It's pretty incredible. Um, so from there, I mean, you would think that 130 years old, right? You've got 130 right. years of production that somebody would come along the way and say, like, we're now the owners of Florida Caña. That has not ever happened. Uh, we are still proudly owned by the Pelas family. We are fifth generation family owned, uh, which is quite the distinction. Uh, three in 10,000 companies in any industry makes it to fifth generation. Usually around third to fourth, you know, you have either somebody comes in and purchases or you have, you know, as we like to joke, you know, we have, uh, you know, some party boy or girl comes in and then ruins it for everybody. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, with, with all that family money, what have you. Uh, but no, that sort of been eye on the prize of producing premium rum for, our, you know, 130 years and five generations. So right. we're very proud of that. Uh, being single estate also allows for Florida Caña to, again, control from field to bottle, which yeah. having that control has actually earned us our fair trade certification. So we are one of the only global spirits to be fair trade certified. Uh, and it's something that we are incredibly proud of. Uh, oh, you know, I mean, that you. that's great. You know, I mean, when you think of other brands, right? When you, and not just in the liquor world, right? Who is fair trade? You think of Patagonia, you think of different chocolates or different coffees, of all these sort of brands. Right. And it's, you don't think about spirits as an agricultural product. But ultimately, that liquid in the bottle started from something agricultural, which means that somebody had to harvest it, which means that somebody had to get it from its raw material to the bottle for you. And for us, we're incredibly proud to be fair trade certified. Um, you know, Foti, what do you think of, when you think of fair trade? What is like the first thing that you think of? Like, what makes something fair trade? I think uh, the actual overall practices of what's implemented. Uh, amongst uh, the folks that actually make the, the production happen. Um, yeah. Equality and in, equality in, in work conditions, uh, pay scale, um, uh, equipment, resources, um, even just for me, it all comes down to the interaction with the people who work for you. Um, all that for me is what comes to mind when it comes to fair trade. It's, it's, yeah. it's basically, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we purchase a product off the shelf and it looks fascinating and it tastes amazing, but we never really think about what goes behind the scenes to make this happen. And as you mentioned, you know, you know, living in the U.S. and for those of us that haven't explored or been, you know, into these parts of the, the world where, you know, things are different and uh, the folks that are out there in the agricultural world um, who spent, uh, you know, many hours backbreaking duties um, to put together what's necessary to produce a, a final product. You know, I think about the people uh, that are Absolutely. more, more about the people who are actually are in the actual fields, uh, whether it's, um, you know, grape growing, sugar cane, um, grains, what have you, you know, there's a, there's an army of, 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 of people who are out there dedicating their, I would say, or compromising their life, style 
uh, to work hard to actually be able to produce what we're having today in this bottle or in our glass. Yeah. No, and I think you, you just hit a lot, a lot of really key points um, that make sort of agricultural production in any company very poignant and what makes fair trade so important, right? I mean, you, you mentioned employees, you mentioned community, you mentioned the process in which something is made. So, you know, for Florida Ganya to be fair trade certified, the way that we're able to do that, again, is that we oversee everything that happens from field to bottle. And just to put it into perspective, right? If you're in Nicaragua, it is hot as heck. You're, you're on your back porch or out in your backyard right now, sweating to death. And I'm in my kitchen a little sweaty right now. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's, it's hot and humid right now. This right. is nothing in comparison to what is happening in Nika in Central America. It's, it's just dense, hot, humid weather. Um, so the things that we put into place for the harvesting of Florida Gaña are largely the part of why we are fair trade certified. Um, if I may just kind of describe some of that. Absolutely, so, please. So when you harvest sugarcane, it's really backbreaking, really difficult labor um, because what happens is these husks, it's almost like if you've ever been a little, obviously been a little kid and tried to break a fresh branch in half, right? Like it's too green, it won't snap. So that's sort of what happens a lot of the time in sugarcane fields. So what we do is we burn sugarcane and what that does is it sort of hardens up the husk, right? Okay. That, that bark for lack of a better yep, term. So it allows for us to essentially cut down much easier. Now that would be if we were doing, you know, majority by like, you know, manual labor. We do most of our harvesting because we are a global brand. Keep in mind, we're distributed in, we're the fifth largest premium rum brand globally. So we are a very big brand despite, wow. you know, sort of uh, our, our local premium size. So when we harvest, we're about 90 to 95% mechanized. The only percentage, that tiny percentage that is done manually is really cared for because we recognize how intense those that labor is. Sure. So what we do, we have uh, sort of machetes, for lack of a better term, right, that are ergonomical, that we've created. Everybody has to wear protective gear to make yep. sure that nobody is hurt while in the field. Uh, mandatory Ooh. breaks are incredibly important for us. There's sort of this solution that's given. That's almost like a Gatorade, right? Or Pedialyte, some sort of an electrolyte solution. Okay. Um, that other companies might give you like one or two, you know, per day, unlimited for us. Um, so when you're in the field, we, we want to take care of our employees and, and our partners. Yeah. From there, it actually extends further into the community. So in 1913, you heard me right, 1913, we opened up a company school. And that is free for all of the children for the employees of Florida Gagna and for our sugar mill. Oh, that's amazing. Um, it's a beautiful facility. I've been there. It's incredible. The people who work there, the teachers are absolutely just, just incredible, incredibly like wonderful, wonderful people. Um, further in 1958, uh, we opened up a company hospital. So for the same reasons, you know, uh, we've just, just for anybody that works for Florida Gagna and for San Antonio for our, our sugar mill, anybody who works for the company can go there free of charge on behalf of Florida Canyon. So this is really important for us as well to make sure that the welfare of our, our team is, is there. Um, we donate to a ton of nonprofits. We have a community fund. So actually every bottle, doesn't matter which mark and which year of Florida Canyon you purchase, yep. every bottle of Florida Canyon, we actually have a community fund that is then given to the community where Florida Canyon is produced for them to say, okay, uh, we need a new road. We need new whatever for the school. So we give money back to the community. And by that, I mean, you give money back to the community every time that you purchase Thank Florida Canyon, That's cool. which That's is really cool. wonderful. Um, and it, you know, I mean, from, from that alone, that gives us the sort of community and employee side of what fair trade means. But fair trade also means the environmental aspects, right? So sure. that is where a holistic model that we're operating under, which includes that environmental. And I think that's something that's like really important for a lot of people right now, right? Last year's like most Googleable or like, you know, top word was uh, climate change last year. So people are very conscious of what's happening environmentally. And so Florida Gunny has taken a stance to make sure that, that 
we are a brand with a purpose in that that particular avenue. So for Florida Kanya, right, let's talk about the process of what Florida Kanya does and how we produce our rum. Again, fair, we are, uh, excuse me, field to bottle. I've already talked about that. We cut down, we produce, we have, we distribute sugar. We are a wholesaler for sugar as well from our sister uh, sugar mill. We take the molasses and that's sort of the liquid gold for Florida Kanya. We then go into fermentation. And again, what happens in fermentation? You get alcohol and CO2. Now CO2 is not exactly the best for the ozone and for the environment, especially at the scale that we're producing rum. Okay. Right? So what we do is we actually have closed fermentation tanks. So it's not just gas sort of bubbling up and over. We have closed fermentation tanks. So we capture the CO2 and we distribute that to beer and soda companies in Nicaragua. Oh. So that's completely recycled back to other companies. From there, Brilliant. we go into distillation. We distill five times, as I mentioned. We use all column stills, so continuous still, much like a whiskey production. Uh, and for us, that's what we get the purest form of uh, flor de caña for us. Again, many other companies will do other processes, but for us, that's, that's what we do. Then we go into ex-bourbon barrel. Again, recycling those barrels coming from the US, because if you're making bourbon, it has to be new white oak. So we take those used barrels, we recoup them in Nika, and then from there, we age. Where we're located is at the base of San Cristobal, which is the most active volcano in Nicaragua. So it's super hot <laughs> and super, wow. super humid. So in a brief amount of time, we're actually able to get a lot of barrel integration. Now, how do we process or how do we power this entire operation? Well, as I said, when you cut down sugarcane, right, what ends up happening is you press out the juice, right? And then you're left right. with that husk as we were talking about. Well, we chop up that husk and we actually use that. We burn that and power a steam turbine that powers the entire distillery. Whoa. So we are completely distilled with renewable energy, 100%. Uh, and we are actually energy positive. We supply energy to Nicaragua's ener uh, national grid. And because wow. of our fermentation, we're actually now, and I'm very proud to announce to all of you this year, uh, we are actually carbon neutral this year. So it's a huge, huge accolade for us. And we're very proud to, to boast. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. Uh, I mean, just to listen to what you're saying just makes me want to drink Flor de Caña all the time. Good. Well, you have a bottle. I saw it. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Don't, don't even. He's like, oh, I wish I had some. <laughs> but... Uh, so, the, you know, Kayla, you, you know, you've hit a lot, a lot of great points. You know, I, you know we're, we're all big supporters of um, producers uh, and companies that actually take these steps. Um, I mean, everything you just mentioned about Flora County, it's like, why wouldn't you support a company that actually gives back so much um, sure. into their, you know, their, their community? But that also trickles uh, beyond their community. You know, I think that's a global a statement that they're making but uh you know more or less uh now we, i'd like to move into the fact that you know let's let's discover together as you know we're sipping i'm sure some of our folks who don't have it are, are going to wonder what it's like but let's get into the actual products that we have i know i noticed that you have sure. three different bottles in front of you i do i do uh, uh, and did we mention that uh you know florida uh, in nicaragua there's an active volcano right Yes, so that's San Cristobal, which the distillery, as I mentioned, is very close. We're actually five miles away um, from where we barrel Florida Cañas. So it's, so, again, well, that dense, hot, humid climate. Volcanic soils us. and so forth. Exactly. I mean, it's you have volcanic soil, which enriches the sugar cane itself. You have the water coming down from the actual volcano, which enriches the fields additionally. But it, ultimately, I think the most important part about it is really the aging process. Okay. Um, and, you know, quickly, I think the best way that I can describe that is, you know, we're up here in New England, it gets really cold, right? Right now I'm dying, but it does get really cold. And okay. so, you know, when you think about the way that a barrel works and operates, right, to kind of put it into layman's terms, when you put that clear spirit into a barrel, teeny tiny barrel, right? I leave it outside from November to February right? Or even all year, whatever, say, say okay. November to February, just because those are chilly months. 
when you personally are walking around Boston and you're cold or just New England in general, and it's those months, you are bundled up, right? You've got your layers, you do this, your skin closes up, your pores tighten, right? Because it's sure. cold. The same thing is happening to the wood in the barrel. So when you are aging something in cold weather or, yep. you know, tempered weather, the barrel doesn't really open up to give anything. And by anything, I mean flavor or color. So if you were to look at a 12 year old scotch, for example, it would look a, a bit lighter than our Florida Caña uh, rum. Okay. And the reason for that is because the barrel hasn't quite opened up enough in that Scottish climate to integrate color and flavor. For Florida Caña, it is as hot as it is today, if not more, <laughs> at sure. the base of San Cristobal. So for us, like if you think of yourself as a barrel, you're sweating. The same thing is happening with the barrel. So the barrel's letting more air in and out. It's let air, you know, similar to what we're doing now in the sense that we're like, oh, please, it's so hot. Like let the air come through. The well, same thing is happening with the barrel. So the liquid inside is integrating a bit more. Well, so well, when, when you're looking at something like aged spirits, that's ultimately why, right? Like you, you're seeing sort of that, that terroir, as you would discuss in, in the wine world, right plays a big part in the rum world as well from sugarcane all the way to barreling see i never knew and thankfully that there we have you a lot of color because it's fascinating <laughs> to know what goes on behind the scenes and what put and put things into perspective um so sure. again going back to the fact that you know you you've got three bottles there that are, in, that are in front of you which all look pretty intriguing um i and myself and ari we both have the 12 year with us here right um, yes. Even though this looks like it hasn't been used, this is my second bottle since uh, uh, we've been prepping for this for the last couple of weeks. That's what I like to hear. Good, right? yeah, good, but, good um, work. <laughs> you know, and we did promise uh, our audience that uh, you will be demonstrating two cocktails for us uh, with Florida. Absolutely. Cocktail. And Absolutely. Uh, maybe use, uh, give us a really quick brief rundown of what's in those three bottles and what makes them so different from each other. Sure. So, uh, each mark of Florida Caña is a little bit different from the yeast that we offer, right? So as I said, when you ferment, you are using yeast to eat up those sugars that then create alcohol. Right. So I won't go into the detail of that, but each one of them has a different yeast strain, as we call okay. it. So that flavor will be always a little bit different, but it doesn't impart that much flavor to the, the overall product. As yep. I said, Florida Caña is a dry style of rum. What that means is that we let it ferment for the most part all the way to its natural end, right? So we let the yeast just do its work. We don't add any sugars. So that's really important for Florida Caña. So our 12 year, and the way that we age is what we call an absolute average blending, right? And aging. So when you have Florida Caña 12, notice that it doesn't say Florida Caña 12 single barrel. It doesn't say Florida Caña 12 year. This is an absolute average blend of rums of similar ages Yep. around 12 years. So what you have in here is rums as old as 16 years and as young as eight. So nice. when you think about the value, right? When you go and you purchase a spirit that's 16 years old, think about the price tag that's associated with that. Ooh. Now, yeah, right? <laughs> You're getting, <laughs> and then I mean, think about it as we continue on down the lineup, but you're getting a spirit that it has rums as old as 16 years in there, the core of which is 12, but the absolute average as we, we understand it to right. be is 12 years. That makes more when sense. When we talk about our 18, the same math applies. So these are rums at the core are 18 years with an absolute average being 22, all the way down to 14. Mm. So you've got juice in here that is 22 years old. I dare you to go and find something for the value out there another spirit category even that has been resting in ex bourbon barrel for that long and then vatted together i mean this is it's an incredible spirit so our 12 year yep. drinks a little bit sweeter yep. than our 18 our 18 is pretty much bone dry it is the i would argue one of the driest spirits that we have and by dry i mean when you do like that which i hate that noise sorry for everybody else who does but when you do that, your, your mouth literally dries out, your tongue dries out. 
uh, and that's from the oak tannin. It's from, from the actual barrel itself. And then our 25, as you can see, I've maybe did a little damage on the 25. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> is, there any, is there anything left in that bottle? There's a little. I'll drink it in front of you right. if you want. Like, <laughs> like, not fair, though. That's not fair at all. Uh, our 25 really is like the creme de la creme of our, our entire portfolio. Because, again, when you think about the math, the same math applies at all three. So what ends up happening is you have core of 25. The oldest liquid is 29 years old, and the youngest is 21. Wow. So this is a decade worth of absolutely delicious aged so rum. Sweet. And it's, it's really a very special bottle, uh, certainly something that we, you know, could celebrate with. And then the differences are, you know, 12 years cocktail spirit, 18 years sipping neat rocks, sparkling water, that sort of thing. And 25, best on its own neat or on neat. the rocks. Oh, definitely. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, or large cube. So these are, these are our, our super premium, ultra so premium categories so we're not we're not making cocktails with a 25 year right now i mean i'll make a daiquiri no, if kidding, you want I'm let's kidding, get weird buddy <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. but uh Whatever let's, you want. let's let's get right to it i think um cool. our audience is uh you know Great. anticipating your your demonstrations on the two cocktails Excellent. that we want you to feature and uh Perfect. why don't you uh, why don't you take it away kayla and let's start with the first cocktail Awesome. Uh, Foti, I'm just going to switch that around real fast because I have to grab some ice as it is yeah, incredibly definitely. hot. So um, would you mind telling them about the opportunity to purchase yes. some Florida so, Kanye with, with you guys? Hopefully all of us now are, are, are a little more intrigued about rum than before. And uh, we have this great opportunity where we're featuring uh, the Florida Kanye 12 year uh, that's available on our platform to purchase. And it comes along with a nice little set here. So it comes with a Fortecaña mixing can with the logo right on the uh, can itself, along with a Fortecaña mixing glass. So try to get a shot here. So this rum, Fortecaña rum kit is available on Urban Wine Club's shopping cart. And uh, we'd, we'd love for you to in, uh, take a chance and purchase this kit. Uh, hopefully Kayla and I and the team here over at Urban Wine Club have intrigued your interest on buying Florida Kanya. We highly recommend it um, if you haven't had it before. But this is available for uh, either for the local market. We do local deliveries if you place an order through urbanwineclub.co. And if you live outside of our local delivery radius, uh, it gets shipped to you via FedEx. Um, so please visit the site. Um, we'd love for you to buy a bottle in this kit. Um, I love these uh, these sample kits here with the glass and the can. I think they're, you know, industry grade, so they're not little cheap glasses or cans by any means. Can I uh, quickly awesome. chime in here with, uh, sure. with, with one of my uh, little, uh, I don't know much about rum. You but, do now. Well, yeah. yeah. I was like, liar, uh, now you do. <laughs> after this, absolutely. But the second I took um, the cork off, that aroma is just right just smacked you in the face it's like it's amazing like what do you I, smell I, what's what's what are you picking up well first of all there's i mean it's like a cork right so i have this like kind of oakiness but it's like it's this rich rich like enticing um I want to I want to say intoxicating but like this rich enticing aroma that like i've never smelled in a rum before to be perfectly honest with you. That's fantastic. Uh, so our, our 12 year, like, you know, and when you put it into a glass, it obviously opens up a bit more, but the, you know, it will open up so you can get a little bit more of those esters as we were talking about of that smell. You know, it gives you a lot of that like nuttiness with some toffee, with a little green apple, yeah. like once you really get into it. Um, and again, these are aged in ex bourbon barrels, so you definitely get some caramel and some vanilla as well coming yeah. from those ex bourbon barrels. Yeah, so that's where a lot of that comes from. Uh, I gotta say, I gotta say, Kayla, very, very smooth. I mean, uh, I I just poured a glass out neat before I had it on the rocks. Now that it's cooled down, if you notice, there's sure. a lot of shade. Yeah, it was like it. the sun's kind of setting. <laughs> right, <laughs> nice back there. <laughs> so I gotta say, I mean, extremely smooth. I mean, I'm very pleased with the uh, the textures and the mouthfeel. Absolutely. No, and I'm happy to hear that, you know, and that smoothness again comes from the amount of times that you distill to make sure you get the purest form of alcohol and then you're softening that with the aging in the barrel uh, ultimately. So having that, you know, extended 
amount of time in the barrel is definitely helpful for, for that you know, overall mouthfeel and roundness. And again, we don't add any sugars and we don't add any artificial ingredients or colors. So you don't get that sort of astringency or very astringency rather. Finish. Very clean finish. Very clean, exactly. Yeah. Um, so on that, uh, as far as cocktails go, uh, today I want cocktail. to. Today we're going to be making a rum old fashioned uh, for the first rum cocktail, because I think that what ends up happening is people are kind of, you know, pigeonholed into making a cocktail that is, you know, either rum and coke, uh -huh. or a mojito, or daiquiri, right? And even the daiquiri, a lot of people think that a daiquiri has to be like strawberry flavored and on a beach, I was just gonna say right, that, and yeah. frozen. <laughs> like not it's hand not. shaken, <laughs> okay. which you you know very well. And thank you for this. There's a delicious Florida Cania daiquiri at Ilona. Uh, yes. So hand shaken. Uh, and so, you know, I think that introducing rum into a cocktail that is sort of, you know, it's in cocktail canon, right? And introducing uh, rum into an old fashioned is something that you can do very easily. And with something that isn't a sweet style of rum, you can absolutely control the sweetness going into your drink. And I think that's where this cocktail works incredibly well. So what I'm going to do today is this is for ease of execution at home. For those of you that are bartenders, beverage managers, what have you out there, cocktail experts, you can certainly drinkers. do this in your, yeah, just drinkers in general. You can certainly do this at your bar as well with the modifications. Uh, you know, there's a thousand different uh, variations of this. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna use, for both cocktails that we're gonna do, we're gonna use our Florida Cania 12. Again, this has a little bit of sweetness to it, uh, which comes from residual sweetness from the fermentation pr process of Florida Cania, but also from yep. the barrel itself. So I'm gonna do two ounces of Florida Cania, and it's going right in the glass. Like we're not gonna get too crazy about it, right in whatever glass you're gonna be drinking. Again, for ease of execution at home, Let's not make more dishes while making Florida Cania cocktails. That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. Then I'm going to add some sugar to my drink. Um, so the old fashioned is typically spirit, bitters, sugar. It's an old fashioned style cocktail. Those are the three ingredients, no citrus, right? So this, whereas you may be like, oh, where are my cherries and my orange and all of this, right? Not happening today. We're not doing it. So then we're going cool. to take our sugar and I'm using turbinado sugar, which is partially refined. So that's why it's got that brown color. It's not perfectly refined uh, as your white sugar would be. And I'm gonna add a half an ounce right into the glass. And you'll start to see it's, it's syrupy, it's kind of thick. From there, I'm gonna add Angostura bitters, which is probably the most common and ubiquitous bitter that you'll find on any bar, anywhere with it, whatever style of bar. And you're gonna wanna add two, three dashes of that. What Angostura bitters does is it gives it sort of this herbal dry quality. So it's gonna balance out the sweetness but it's also gonna bring out some of those flavors from the rum and from the syrup. Then I'm gonna take orange bitters. Now there's a ton of different varieties of orange bitters. Regan's is the one that I prefer. Okay. I'm gonna do the same thing. One, two, three dashes into my glass. And then from there, you certainly want to add ice. And now again, this is a dish free situation. We're going, <laughs> you know, we wanna go as simple as possible on this. Uh, when you're, and this is called a cocktail build for, for if you've ever heard of a built drink or anything like that. So I'm going to take a cocktail. Yes, of course. Any, What's any preference of the, the, the type of ice? I noticed you have really nice symmetrical cubed ice there, but sure. um, does the ice make a difference? The ice does make a difference. So I think a lot of the time, uh, I don't know if you've heard this in your time uh, in, in the beverage world, but a lot of people sometimes will say, oh, I'll have mine with light ice, right? It's like, okay. oh, hold the ice. Well, the ice just dilutes faster, right? When you have drinks that are, you know, say a rum and Coke, right? Let's come back to that. And you say, right. oh, light ice. Well, all that does is dilute your drink. It doesn't chill it at all. All it does is but dilute. Very good point. So what you want to do when you're making cocktails is make sure that you have an appropriate amount of ice. And coming back to the quality of ice, I just have like a silicone little tray here. Nothing crazy. Little square yeah, cubes. They're one, one inch by one inch. Um, I didn't filter them or anything, just tap water. We are fortunate. We live in Boston with some really great water, you know, cool. comparatively to other places. Uh, and so I do think that the, the ice that you have, you want to make sure that your ice isn't going to dilute too quickly, right? Okay. It's not going to melt very, very quickly. The smaller the ice cube, the smaller the surface, the faster the dilution. 
That's why you see a lot of people drinking whiskey on a large cube or in an ice sphere, right? It's the smaller, the, the surface area I'm or the more you, surfaces. Like yep. The more surfaces that you have, the many cubes that you may throw in there, the more surfaces, the faster the dilution, so the, typically the tip, speaking. The tip here is big ice. Big ice or consistently sized cubes. And so what we're gonna do today, I don't care if you use a tablespoon from your drawer, a straw that you have from wherever you got your coffee this morning or a bar okay. spoon, you're just gonna stir up your drink a little bit. That's it. And the reason that you stir your cocktails is that pretty much everything that's in the glass is the same density yep. and it's the same, it's gonna dilute the same, essentially is what I mean by that. So by stirring my cocktail, I'm chilling and I'm diluting because ice is for me the most important ingredient in a cocktail. It's sort of that trick question that I ask people sometimes. But the more, you know, the more you work in the cocktail world, I think it's the most important ingredient is having great ice. I've worked in bars that had horrible ice and it's very difficult to manage your cocktails. So you're gonna give that cocktail a little quick stir for two reasons, to chill and to dilute because I don't wanna drink my rum my bitters and my syrup at room temperature, right? Have you ever, like, Fuji, have you ever had, I'm just gonna grab a, a quick thing real fast. Have you ever had a, a bad cocktail experience where you've had sort of that, uh, uh, you know, I, somebody I, gave you an over diluted drink or something of the sort? Um, well, that would, that would then, um, that would, you know, that would kind of um, tell you about all the bad places I've been to. But yes, I've had, I've had uh, my fair share of, bad drinks uh, and not because of the place but unfortunately depending on who's tending bar you know sure. sometimes drinks do very you, you know will, will have variations but yeah i've had my sure. share of bad drinks and like you said bad ice um, yeah. not bad ice but you know poor ice or just um being inconsistent with the recipes and so forth but yes i've, I've had sure. my share. over dilution those sort of things you know we've all had one cocktail that tasted different than the other that we we pretty much ordered the exact same drink at right. the exact same bar, right? Right, um, right. And then, so now that we've, we've executed the cocktail itself, we got the liquid in the cup, uh, next is our garnish, right? So garnish is really important because it should impart something to your drink. I think that garnish that is uh, just there for fluff can be fun and it's a big part of the tiki culture within rum. But when you're right. making something like a rum old fashioned, you want just simple garnish. Right. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a whole lemon, not lemon. an orange, okay. not blowing an orange. your mind. Yeah, blowing your mind right now. Uh -huh. And we're going to wow. peel that. And so if you can see here, I've peeled from the skin and I've left this white part. The white part is the pith. The pith right. is very bitter and it has its functions in cocktail syrups, it has its functions in, in culinary worlds altogether. Uh, but it does us no good in our cocktail for this this particular purpose. Okay. So I've just got this little peel here, fresh off the, the lemon. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna express it over the top. And how I'm gonna do that is taking it horizontal and just squeezing it towards me so that the outside basically expresses out those lemon oils, right? And you'll be able to see it come out of it. And then I'm just gonna kind of like touch the rim of the glass with it okay. so that those oils are on the, the edge. And then I'm gonna say, forget about you, lemon, because I don't want you floating in my drink. Oh. Because it's already done its job, right? Like I've already got the oil. I don't need something floating aimlessly in my drink. Do you, you talk can do your, this? Do you talk to your lemon peels often? I do actually. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> I have a very close relationship with citrus. Uh, <laughs> so they so they understand. <laughs> they understand. There's no offense. We had a conversation before this. It's totally fine. <laughs> So, but the purpose of this, right, is that I don't want to be drinking a drink and like moving that, that peel around. I've already expressed the oils. It's already done what it's going to do for me. There are more sustainable ways to do this, which would include making an, uh, like an oil spray, which you can definitely Google and it's very doable. Um, okay. And it's something that gives you the ability to utilize the whole citrus fruit and then express it over the top of your, your drink. So now we have our Florida Dine 12 Old Fashioned, built very similarly to a and classic old fashioned made with whiskey, but it's gonna be much smoother. And Kayla, if I can add that um, mm. for our audience that actually would wanna try this, this is, we have the recipe sure. loaded on our 
uh, webinar web uh, event page, but we'll definitely have that uploaded to the website. So for those of us that uh, want to come back to it, you can see the recipe on Urban Wine Club's uh, page as well. And the app. And the app. And the app. <laughs> and the app. Uh, How about the app. God, you guys are so prepared. I love it. Um, and then, so that's our rum old fashioned. Again, the takeaway from here is to utilize aged rums uh, into sort of classic style cocktails and, and walk away with that. One more, one more quick question before we move on to the next recipe or cocktail. The, the simple syrup or the syrup that you, or the sugar that you just uh, mentioned, in case sure. we don't have access to it, what would be your second go-to substitute for it? Simple syrup works just fine. And simple, simple syrup, syrup is just made with granulated white sugar. Um, okay. It works just fine. The reason that I utilize uh, turbinado sugar um, or even brown sugar, right, uh, is that it has those remaining notes of molasses. Because okay. again, think about how sugar is refined, right? Like you're taking away from those molasses notes, the closer you get to what we call table sugar, right? Those white granulated sugar. So if you have darker sugar, it's gonna have more of those molasses notes and it'll play very well with rum. Any uh, suggestions of where our audience could possibly find uh, and pick up some of that turbinaro sh um, sugar? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you can find it at pretty much any grocer, uh, sugar in the raw has one, uh, which is you know, a pretty ubiquitous brand uh, that you would find. So Whole you can Foods definitely Trader find Joe's. them. Yeah, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Star Market, um, okay. Stop and Shop. You can find it pretty much at any cool. mainstream grocer. Cool. So Excellent. no problems there. Thanks for that, Kayla. Yeah, of course. All right. So now we're going to move on to our um, next uh, exciting, delicious cocktail. This is one of my absolute favorite cocktails. Um, so I'm very excited to share it with you guys. Uh, it's a riff on sort of this cocktail called uh, the Legionnaires Club that originated in Boston uh, at one of my favorite bars and restaurants. And I apologize if my dog barks in the background. Okay. Uh, this is a cocktail that is built on rum, mint, sugar, bitters, coffee, and I added in the coconut. Ooh, so instead wow. of That's having decadent. instead of having lime juice, where you would basically have a coconut or excuse me, a coffee mojito, right? This is something that you have, or a co or excuse me, a coffee daiquiri, right? This is something where you're kind of introducing more of the sweeter flavors. You're giving it a little bit of a bigger, what we call mouthfeel, right? For lack of a better term. Right. Uh, so we're making a little bit of a bigger drink. And I also love coffee drinks. I just so love them. Have, I think that it, we, we can have sorry. this in the morning. We can have this for breakfast. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not going to stop you. Okay. So, <laughs> so now as there are many other rums out there that all will vary in flavor, complexity, taste, what have you, there yeah. are also a lot of coffee liqueurs out there. Um, so I just want to preface that with we're using today Boston Harbor Distillery's coffee liqueur. Um, you can utilize cold pressed coffee. You can or use, you know, drip coffee. You can use espresso at your house. You don't have to do an, a liqueur. Okay. But this works very well in this particular cocktail because it's a very dry, dry particular uh, gotcha. spirit. So. What we're gonna need for this particular cocktail is of course, Florida Caña. So we're gonna add one and a half ounces of Florida Caña. And this is going to be a shake technique. So as uh, you were saying, you've got those cocktail shakers that are what we call Boston style, right? They're Boston shakers. Um, is that the that term? These, these are called Boston shakers? They're called Boston shakers. So when you have glass on tin, it's called a Boston shaker. Is that, is that really from, is it I'm not really, even making it up. I'm not even making so it up. This here is from, it's roots of There Boston. it is. That is the Boston shaker, <laughs> which if you ever need to get any sort of uh, cocktail wear outside of your Florida Caña stuff, uh, you know, your, your materials, there is a place in Boston, in Somerville called the Boston shaker. That's that right. gives you access to many other cocktail did you know uh, that, Ari? You know, tools and treats. Yeah, it's it's literally like a five minute walk from my apartment. Well, thanks for telling yeah, me. Right. You're right. You said you're in Maryland. Don't <laughs> lie to me. <laughs> All right. Now we know where Ari lives. <laughs> yeah. Just, just so we're gonna add add up from uh, the Shaker Company, and uh, you'll find me. Except I'm in Maryland right now. No Shaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Shaker boy. <laughs> 
so so far we've got our florida gunny we're going to add an ounce and a half into our our if you are doing this at home using a pint glass is totally fine i'm using a short cocktail tin that's totally fine as well whatever you have you're just going to be shaking so as long as you have a vessel that will close on both ends and okay. vacuum seal essentially so you can shake and not get it all over yourself do it <laughs> whatever you have then i'm going to use again that boston harbor so if you guys can see that there it's Boston Harbor Coffee Liqueur. Can we, can we give a shout out to uh, Rhonda Kalman from Boston Distillery. Of course we can. Uh, we love Rhonda and she makes exceptional uh, uh, products, I should say, right? She Ron does, she Rhonda, does. Rhonda's the person who turned me from a very light and fruity alcohol drinker into a whiskey drinker. Whoa. What were <laughs> you drinking? Putnam <laughs> Rye? Yes, right. and I was scared. We, we actually went to her to do a podcast and they were drinking and I'm like, no, 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 I'm good. Thank no, you. no, no. <laughs> and then I'm like, after a while, I saw them having such a good time that I'm like, all right, let me try this. And then I've been an alcoholic ever since. Yeah, yeah they sucked you right <laughs> in, didn't they? With that Blame delicious cotton rye. <laughs> I like it. Blame it on Rhonda. <laughs> yeah, I blame it on Rhonda. So, so we can blame this cocktail on Rhonda entirely. This is all her fault. Name, we should name the cocktail Blame It on Rhonda. Yeah, this is no longer the Floor Cafe. This <laughs> is Blame It on Rhonda. I like it. <laughs> but, uh, so all right. then we're going to use Rhonda's spirit here, uh, and we're going to add one full ounce of coffee liqueur. You're going to do the same thing if you're using coffee at home. Uh, okay. You'll be doing the exact same thing. Um, truthfully, espresso or some sort of like a, a very – concentrated coffee works best for this uh, okay. simply because you want that coffee flavor without over diluting right? right like you're already going to be adding ice so then again right into your glass or your tin what have you you're going to add sugar we're still using the same turbinado sugar this is the beauty of this drink is that you can do as much sugar or as little sugar as you would like i don't like very sweet drinks but okay. i do think that sugar balances a drink so i'm only going to add a half an ounce into my cocktail Right on into there. And now I'm going to blow your minds with some coconut milk. <laughs> Whoa. So we're doing coconut milk. Uh, reason for coconut milk rather than any other quote unquote dairy product is that I know that there's a lot of people out there who have dairy allergies and are uh, adverse for having, you know, some sort of, of, you know, milk or dairy product in their cocktail. Uh, and so the reason for that using the coconut is that exactly. This is unsweetened. Again, I don't like very sweet cocktails personally. I want to be able to control my sugar, which is exactly what I did with my turbinado. So I'm going to add one full ounce of coconut milk mm. right on in there. Then I'm going to add two dashes, one, two of that Angostura bitters that we saw in the yep. rum old fashioned. And now I have a lot of mint in my life right now, as I described to you guys before we got on here. I love and I'm it. going to pick off a couple of these leaves. So just, just a couple, like, you know, eight or nine good chunks of leaves here. Bloop, 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 right on in there. And you're like, Kayla, you're so crazy. Why are you dumping all of that in there? That's wild. Then I'm going to throw ice right into the tin or into yeah. your shaker. Okay. And now this is the other side of your Boston shaker, right? Right. This is the tin portion of it. And what happens is that this metal is going to conduct, quote unquote, conduct or chill your glass. And so I'm going to put that on there at, can you see this, that it's on an angle? Yes. So this gap here, you want to be able to like kind of stick your finger in this gap here before yeah. you close the gap. And the reason, whether it's glass or tin, whatever it is, right? If you're using a pint glass, doesn't matter. The reason for that is because otherwise you create a vacuum seal that you can't open. <laughs> and that stinks. <laughs> so we've all done it. I've done it a thousand times I've, at the bar, oh, yeah. and you're like, uh. Awkward. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, like, I've, I've done this for a bit, but I, I'm lousy yeah, at my at job you. today. <laughs> so then you're just going to smack the top of your tin, the taller tin, and you're going to flip this over. And the reason that you flip it over, this side, for those of you at home that don't have metal, is going to be your glass. Now, why do you do that? Because if I'm sitting at your bar or at yep. your dining room table, I don't want this side coming at me if it comes open. Oh. I'm not only going to get hit with glass, but I'm going to get hit with all the crap that's in this tin, right? So we're just going to shake. And when you shake, you want to have this forward to back motion. 
you'll see so many people with these like really fancy cocktail shakes. It's very simple. It's just back and forth. And that's that. So you're gonna shake it for about 10 to 15 seconds if you've got that glass, about 10 seconds if you have tin on tin, right, metal on metal. And then to get it open is really the trick. How many times have we seen this, this guy happen? We've got this, oh man, I can't get it open. You see so many things. You're gonna wanna hit it again where that space is, where you can fit that. Yeah, yeah, get it. So if both of you wanna hit it on the other side. Right where, so flip it for you, turn the tin. Nope, other way. Sorry, turn it this way. Yeah, there you go. So you wanna hit where that gap is. There you go. And then it's gonna pop open. So that gap is what's gonna separate the glass. And then again, this is for zero work at home, other than having these ingredients and dumping them into a glass with some ice. I want you to just put everything right into the glass. Wow, that looks so decadent. Including the mint, including everything. You are more than welcome to add more ice to this. As I said, the way that ice works is it keeps your drink cold. If you don't have enough ice, this will then just quickly dilute. Mm. Uh, crushed ice is really nice for this. You can get a really cheap ice crusher, at, uh, you know, online for very, you know, maybe 10 or 11 bucks. Okay. You can have all the crushed ice in your world <laughs> that you want at home. Um, and so this particular cocktail is very, very simple. And the whole point of it is for you to have, again, that like rum, coffee, really nice, again, decadent, but bright and refreshing coming from the mint. So very simple uh, sort of wow. adaptation of, of some cocktails, some coffee cocktails that we may see out there that are very sweet. So cheers. Cheers. Thank you so much for that because now we can definitely uh, wow our guests uh, I'm making cocktails they probably never had before. Absolutely. So this is, again, it's like that cross between, you know, as I said, that Legionnaire's Club, but also you're adding in like coconut milk. So you give it that, that decadence that you might be looking for in more of a creamy style, even tiki style cocktail. Awesome. So Kayla, now that we've got, you know, you know, you, you, you've, you've wowed us with your skills of how to make uh, great rum cocktails, I wanted to give this before we actually uh, now we're getting close to the finale of our, our webinar is open up this segment to our audience for questions. Pardon me. And I encourage sure, all of our guests who are, who have been, uh, you know, we want to thank them for, uh, for being uh, on this webinar with us for about an hour or so is uh, now is the time to ask uh, Kayla some questions about rum, Florida Kanya cocktails, anything you want. Ari, do you have any questions that we can kick off with? Yeah, so uh, anybody wants to ask a question, I sent a chat uh, message. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, just please type it in. Um, one of the first questions was, are these good sipping rums? And what is the sugar content on these mixers? So mm. these are absolutely wonderful sipping rums. Again, this is a dry style of rum. So what ends up happening in the rum world is a lot of people associate rum as being that overly sweet cocktail. And you kind of hit both on the head there where it's a lot of the sweetness comes from the mixer that you're using, right? And so the, the rums themselves are dry with zero sugar. Like we have zero sugar content and we are certified as such. So these rums, although they come from sugar cane, do not have added sugars and do not have any sugar content. Because again, when you ferment, you're removing the sugar. The yeast is eating the sugar. So for us, we have nothing in there that would qualify as sugar. And again, we're certified as such. And we don't add anything. Regarding the mixers, absolutely. I mean, we've got turbinado sugar as a mixer, right? I mean, that, that's definitely sugar. <laughs> There's no way to cut that. As far as the uh, coconut milk, this is unsweetened. Uh, and regarding Boston Harbor, I apologize. I don't know what the sugar content is on that. I'm not that well-versed in uh, Rhonda's particular uh, process mm -hmm. for producing this, um, but I'm sure we can find out for you. Uh, so the reason why we use the, you know, I demonstrate the rum old fashioned to answer your question is so that you can control the sweetness of your drink in a very standard style drink with a very dry style of rum. Uh, and the same thing with, 
what we uh, now call it's Rhonda's fault or whatever we named Rhonda. this cocktail. Oh, yeah. What, what, uh, was it, what was it? Oh, man. <laughs> blame it on Rhonda. Blame it on Rhonda. Yeah, blame it on Rhonda. There it is. <laughs> blame it on Rhonda. There. Yeah, the wonderful uh, coconut cocktail. You can control the sweetness because the only additive sweetness is perceived as the sugar or perhaps the coffee liqueur. And again, you don't have to add coffee liqueur. You can do this with espresso, cold brew, what have you. Awesome. So these are all up to you to control your sweetness. All right. So, so uh, based on that question, another question came in. And um, can you make these cocktails with stevia instead of sugar, or will it not be as balanced? You can absolutely use stevia. Um, stevia does have a very particular taste. Uh, you know, it does have sort of, I don't, I don't really know how to describe the taste for those who have not had stevia. Um, but you, you can definitely work this cocktail with stevia. Uh, you can work both of them with that. No problem at all. Uh, you would just have to probably play around with the proportions a little bit more than you would, uh, with just standard sugar. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. And my personal opinion is if you drink enough, you could use whatever you want. It doesn't even matter. Dirt, salt, whatever. Right? Hey, 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 we don't, we don't want dirt in our Florida Kanye cocktails, Ari. You settled down over yeah, there. Yeah, because it, it comes from the best <laughs> dirt to begin with, volcanic soil. Yeah, it was like, I mean, it's like, it's already got that volcanic soil. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> uh, we, have, we have another question. Uh, sure. You actually, you, you addressed this earlier, but I think this person came in a little bit late. How many employees sure. do you have at Florida Kanye? Uh, she didn't catch it if you did mention it. Uh, I did not mention uh, that is something that I will absolutely leave my email for because it does vary between technically what you would call uh, working for Florida Kanye during harvest season of our sugar cane versus off season. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to answer, at least in the U.S., we are yep. distributed and supplied with William Grant and Sons, who is in pretty much every state uh, and has many employees, uh, but in the U.S. there are six ambassadors for Florida Ganya. Um, but I'm more than happy to find out an exact number for a uh, person who asked that question. And I apologize that I don't have that at top of mind. Oh, no problem. And then, uh, um, Frank, you have something? Yeah, we have another uh, question from uh, one of our, our guests. Is that um, one of our guests actually is a beverage manager in Harvard Square. And they wanted to ask us, you know, which companies distribute Florida Kanye locally? Sure. So locally, we're actually dueled. We're partnered with both MS Walker and Martinetti. Uh, but we have a specific partnership with United Division within Martinetti. Yeah. But and I, both I get, are equal pricing across the board, of right. course. And if I can just add, I'm big fans of, you know, both. But I, I usually get my Florida Kanye from MS Walker. Fair enough. Yeah, we we are we're Switzerland in that sense. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we we will we will maintain neutrality. <laughs> uh, cool. What else? Uh, I have one, I have another one. Uh, you personally, as an ambassador, what's your favorite uh, drink? Uh, drink as in Florida Cana, like which mark? Or I'm going to fire back uh, a question. I'm sorry. Florida Kanya. But you know what? Uh, which, After that, tell us anything else. Sure. So uh, so my particular favorite Florida Kanya, uh, it does vary depending on what I'm drinking, right? Like, I'm always going to say yes to the 25. Who the heck wouldn't, right? Like, <laughs> of course. Well, you better uh, say But on my, my, right, more, more regular would be the 18 uh, because again I like dry and bitter style drinks and cocktails so for me that works perfectly um, in cocktails however uh, I would say that the 12 is top-notch uh, and in a cocktail in particular it would be the old Cuban uh, which for me I think is like a knock it out of the park sort of cocktail when done right it comprises it's comprised of uh, rum usually aged rum, such as Florida Cana 12, Angostura bitters, which we use today. Uh, sugar, again, turbinado right. is, is fantastic. We use that again today, mint, uh, and then lime juice. So, it, and a little bit of sparkling wine. So this is something that's uh, sort of an adaptation of the mojito, but served up rather than in an elongated drink. And for me, I think it's, when it's done very well, it is one of the best cocktails. Awesome. Um, well, another question, uh, yes. does Florida Kanya offer tours? 
Uh, we have in the past. Uh, currently, we do not. Uh, you know, obviously due to COVID. Um, and oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, would, I would say that you know uh, Nicaragua has been through pretty much the ringer in every sense of the word, uh, whether it be from uh, dictatorship to volcanic eruptions to earthquakes to you know <laughs> whatever you got like wow. to throw at at a country you know Nicaragua has, has dealt with it um, and that has impeded a little bit of our ability to show the brand itself in its home country uh, which we're looking very much forward to COVID ending and kind of opening up our doors again for sure. Yeah awesome. yeah good point because you know uh, Sometimes I get like, like sucked into what we're doing and what we're talking about. And I completely forget the real world out there. Especially sure, sure. <laughs> and, I was uh, like, are you in a fish tank behind you? I can't tell what your background is. <laughs> I, I'm, in a, I'm in a floor de cana haze right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think it, of course the, you're lost, Ari, of course. <laughs> it's, a, it's a better world over here. But uh, no, this-, this uh, Maryland, Caleb. the better world. <laughs> I don't know about that, but maybe I don't know. <laughs> but Kayla, this was uh, this was great. I wanted to thank you for uh, the opportunity to actually enlighten us about rum in general, and also to get us to know a little bit more about Florida Canya. Um, I particularly have still learned quite a bit, even though we've worked together uh, on training sessions with staff at the restaurant level, at the retail level, selling the products. But now getting this one-on-one -on -one with you virtually. Uh, has still made an imprint on myself. Hopefully, Ari and our guests uh, can take away uh, something more than they did before coming into this webinar about rum and Florida Canya. Uh, we wanted to thank you for your time. This would uh, this is not the only time that our audience will uh, get to see you. We definitely hope to have you back soon on some other sessions, uh, maybe some more cocktails. Uh, as we mentioned prior offline, we discussed maybe doing a broadcast at your at your pad. Uh, and so forth. But uh, yeah. any last minute uh, thoughts uh, or comments before we sign off? Uh, I mean, certainly my gratitude for the opportunity to be here on behalf of myself and on uh, behalf of the brands. Uh, you know, I mean, despite being a global brand, we're certainly a growing brand in the US uh, and here in, uh, you know, in, in just mass and in New England in general. Uh, you know, I think if I can leave you guys with anything at all, it's, you know, drink more rum. I know that that sounds silly, but not even in the set as a category as a whole, like drink more rum. It's a very fascinating spirit that has a lot of cultural history uh, and is not just for frozen drinks at a beach resort. You know, I mean, you can drink it in, you know, meat or on the rocks. You can drink it in, varying cocktails you know there, there's some really great books out there that can help you kind of understand rum uh and i'm always here for a resource if people need me as well um you know it's uh, kayla underscore d e underscore kanya c a n a at instagram so uh you know you guys can certainly find me there and ask any questions that you may have about our brand in particular or anything like that and, um, uh, social social media handles that our audience can kind of follow Sure. So the, the Kayla de Cana that I just explained is, is yeah. the, probably the most direct. The most direct, um, right? Yeah, certainly. And that you can find on the Corkstop website as we've been kind of shouting each other out a, a bit. So uh, certainly, well. exactly, exactly. Um, cool. So, I, I mean, I think it's really just like drink more rum, explore more of the category, play with it in cocktails. It's a really versatile spirit um, and has a truly global presence. So I think it's something that, you know, don't, don't limit your scope on rum as a category as a whole. And, uh, you know, we look forward to seeing everybody who's joined us in, in more events and hope that you drink more Florida Kanye. Go, go get your Florida Kanye at the cork stop. <laughs> right. Well, there you have it, folks. Um, thank you so much. Drink more rum. Blame it on Rhonda, if anything. <laughs> uh, you can definitely find Florida Kanye on the Urban Wine Club's uh, shopping cart. We got great uh, rum kits that we have mentioned. Uh, stay tuned for our upcoming episodes. Kayla, we want to thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for spending some time thank with you us guys. tonight. Thank and we you. hope to have you very soon. Awesome. Thank you all. I, I very much enjoyed it. Enjoy your evening and cheers to you all. Thank Salud. you. Cheers. Thank you. Ciao.